to see if, thank you, Borja. And I can now share the floor. Mac, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Alinea, and uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks to everybody uh, in the Age platform also for all the work uh, that has been done in putting this together. We're very much looking forward um, to, uh, to, to today's work um, and to, I guess, consulting with you in this dialogue workshop and to learning from the uh, experiences of the many people uh, who are participating indeed from all over the, the world uh, on, on this workshop. So uh, SHAPES uh, is uh, a project, uh, as Alinea has said, funded by the European Commission. Uh, SHAPES stands for Smart and Healthy Aging through people engaging in supportive systems. Um, and today, uh, looking at diversity and empowerment through the, if you like, the lived realities of older people. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. And this next slide um, looks at the, the word shapes, uh, obviously being an English word. And when you look it up in the dictionary, uh, if you look at what, what does shape actually mean, it has a, a number of different meanings. And I think these all sort of chime with the, the function of, of today. So firstly, it is to form or to create, uh, especially to give a particular form or shape to something. Um, and the SHAPES project is very much about looking at the, the gestalt, the overall picture and the form of how people, uh, place and technology can come together. Uh, next slide, please. Um, secondly, uh, SHAPES also means to adapt in shape so as to fit neatly and closely. So like uh, clothes uh, shaped to his or her figure. Um, in other words, being very sort of uh, stylish and appropriate. And we're really keen that technologies are seen as things that people want to, to use, want to wear, want to be identified with, and they have a positive connotation rather than something that's simply for overcoming a problem. The next line, please. Um, shapes also means to devise, plan, shape a policy. Um, and so Europe-wide social facilitation uh, is, is a key policy element uh, within shapes as well. Next. And then another uh, meaning to embody in definite form, shaping a folk tale into an epic. Um, I was actually surprised when that definition came up because shaping a folk tale into an epic is uh, very much what shapes is, is about. It, but the folk tales are lived folk tales are people's real experience and we start from those folk tales and you'll be hearing about about those today and the epic if you like is how does society organize itself around the lived experience of older people and the next line thank you uh, and then to make fit for a particular use of purpose and to adapt shape the questions to fit the answers uh, again, I was a bit surprised to come across the, the idea of shape the questions to fit the answers. Um, but again, it's exactly what the SHAPE's project is, is about. And, and the people are the, the, the answers. Um, so the, the answer to successful aging is making it easier for older people to live uh, in a natural way in their own communities. And if we can use technology and other sorts of social facilitation to do that, uh, then that's the aim of the SHIPS project. Uh, next, please. And if you don't believe me on any of those definitions, if you think I made them up, you can go to that uh, online dictionary and you'll find them there. Thanks. Uh, so the vision for SHIPS is uh, that we will build, pilot, and deploy a large-scale EU standardized open platform um, to facilitate healthy and active aging and the maintenance of high quality of life uh, in the community. And to do that, there's four different structures that we use. There's the SHAPES uh, digital technologies. There's the SHAPES uh, ecosystem, which supports uh, all of that. And then there's the SHAPES marketplace, because of course, 
technologies come through a marketplace and are, are traded either publicly or, or privately. And then there's the shapes, shapes recommendations, which is to do both at national level and at EU policy level. Next, please. So uh, SHAPES is a 48 month project um, from November 2019 through to October 2023. So we're basically halfway through the project now. We have uh, 210 staff, 36 organizations and working across 14 uh, European countries. Uh, we'll engage 2000 older people uh, across 15 uh, pilot and replication uh, sites. We have 10 different working packages um, and uh, sorry, the, the, the 10 different sites incorporate 10 what's called reference sites of the European Innovation Partnership on active and healthy aging. Um, and so it's building into an existing infrastructure within Europe. And the overall funding for the project is uh, 21 million. Next slide, please. Um, so on this slide, I have a, a number of diagrams, um, but they're really in the background and, and the diagram most in the foreground I wanted to uh, talk about is a, a pie chart that shows the percentage of uh, different sorts of stakeholders in the consortium. Um, so universities are about a third of the 36 partners, uh, very large scale industry one, uh, research and training organizations, there's, there's two of those, uh, small and medium enterprises, there's 15 of those, so just over 40%. Uh, Non-governmental organizations, four of those, and uh, public bodies, uh, two of those. So a very broad range of stakeholders uh, involved, including very importantly lived experience. Next, please. Um, we have many uh, multiple and fascinating uh, technologies. Uh, and I have a slide here which uh, shows pictures of a few of the different technologies. I, I won't describe them all, but to, just to give an example, there is a multimodal biometrics uh, with face and emotion recognition. There is um, activity recognition and well being uh, assessment uh, device. There are a couple of different types of robots. Um, and then there's a, a, a rather complicated diagram looking at the internet of things and big data platforms and how they might interface. Um, and we also have a representation of, of security and I'll say a little bit more about that. So lots of different and diverse uh, technologies. Um, the project, I reiterate, it's not about the technology, it's about the people. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the uh, different pilot themes. So we have seven broad themes that we want to uh, explore throughout the project. One of them is caring for older individuals with neurodegenerative diseases. Another one is physical rehabilitation at home. Then there's cross-border health data exchange, which will support mobility and accessibility for older individuals as they move between different European countries. Another theme is uh, psychosocial and cognitive stimulation, uh, promoting well-being. Um, another one is the uh, medicine control and optimization. Then there's smart living uh, environment for healthy aging at home and improving in-home and community-based care. So I'm sure from those you get the sense that we want this to be in people's home, keeping them in the community, keeping them engaged uh, as, as sort of meaningful members of a community that they value. Next, please. So I just wanted to finish off with some shapes, questions and answers as it were. Um, so a, a, a basic question, how do older people live their lives now and in the future? Um, and you're gonna hear some of the answers that we find from the people them, themselves. And one of the things that we, we do in response to that is to develop personas, which are, if you like, simplified ways of understanding some of the challenges that people uh, 
experience in in life and then we we use what's called use cases so what are their needs and how will these needs be addressed by shapes um how, how are the the needs that they experience uh, managed by the sort of platform and the technologies that we're developing here and can digital technologies really contribute to improving people's lives because uh, sometimes they can actually get in the way of uh, social interaction so we want to make sure that they're facilitating uh, positive interaction and identity and not being a barrier to it um, and so we develop mock-ups and we develop prototyping we see on a very uh, limited level how this might work with people and then we move to the next level which is deployment uh, in the pilots that i mentioned earlier and the replication sites so the basic question there is how might this work in real life settings um, and if we find that it does work and is helpful in real life settings then uh, important questions are around what sort of supports and infrastructure is needed so that digital technologies are part of a system that works to really empower users. Um, in other words, putting the power, the control, the decision-making much more in their hands than has previously been the case. So we're very uh, interested in systems, in markets, in governance, and of course in ethics, making sure that people's personal data uh, has uh, appropriate safeguards around it um, and that their, their own well-being is enhanced through their contribution of their personal data, albeit data that is uh, anonymized and uh, they get to decide who accesses that data. So lots of tricky issues there that um, perhaps there will be questions about that uh, during this morning. So last slide, please. Um, and uh, I, I guess that's just different ways of contacting us and seeing where the SHAPES pro project is uh, profiled. Um, I very much look forward to hearing the uh, presentations. I know we have some terrific presentations coming up and to hearing uh, your comments uh, through the audience and uh, learning from your own perspectives on these as well. So thank you very much. And I hope everyone has a, a really enjoyable uh, morning of it. Over to you again, Elena. Many, many thanks, Mac, indeed, for this very inspiring and also promising introduction of the SHAPES project. Um, I will now give the floor to our first moderator, Francisco Trigueros from the World Federation of the Deaf Blind, to introduce the first panel and drive us uh, through the questions and answer session afterwards. Is Francisco com coming, joining? Elena, we have uh, a little issue. I don't think Francisco is in the room at the moment. Okay. So, well, let's, um, I, I will take then Francisco role, if I may. I'm not sure if he'll be joining uh, soon. So I would like to welcome um, our three first uh, panelists. Uh, we have uh, Joke de Reuter Zwaninken from uh, H Platform Europe, uh, Sanya Tarzai from the World Federation of the Deaf Blind, and Mark Whitley from the European Union of the Deaf. And I would like to give the floor to Joke to start. Thank, thank you, uh, Elenia. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I feel honored uh, with the opportunity to represent Edge Platform Europe in this webinar and to learn more of SHAPE. Uh, and thank you, Mac, for your presentation, which was very clear. And um, I, in my presentation, will uh, look for the other side of meaning, what it means getting older or being old. Edge. Uh, platform seeks always the awareness for stereotyping, combat ageism, and age discrimination. And that's the leading points uh, for what I tell you. I will give you uh, my view uh, on um, uh, about older persons and stereotyping aging and 
age discrimination. And I will do this by taking my own, <coughs> I'm so sorry, <coughs> own experience as a start. I'm 77. I'm the wife of mother, grandmother, and informal care for my sister-in-law, who is nearly blind, bad hearing, and lightly mentally disabled. I'm an active member of Age Platform in the task force, for instance, Healthy Aging. I'm the president of Older Women's Network Europe, as well as the Netherlands. And when COVID rules allows me, I will be voluntary in the library and community house of my village. I'm a, uh, I am an atrocious patient. And in each role who I am or what I do, this can be stereotyped. Old woman, gray, vulnerable, whatever. And uh, it's so easy and it's so common to stereotype. We do it all the way and it, it helps us how we, do, how we look at people. But uh, it, has a, uh, it has a special outcome sometimes for the, the one who is stereotyped. We live in a small apartment building with neighbors more or less of our age. Some older, some younger. And like my husband and I, they support their families, mind their grandchildren, are informal carers, volunteers in culture, in sport, local politics, and all other kinds of social involvement. Some of them are rather disabled, but that does not hold them back in living a full life within our society. But articles in papers, surveys, and statistics as well on television and in politics, we are told that we are older persons, we will cause a tsunami of need in care. Although most of all other older people are living independently. Only two and a half percent in institutions, only 11 to 12 percent receiving home care. That, uh, that do not, I do not deny that uh, these facts, uh, but the way the debate is held is, uh, uh, is even, uh, uh, I can tell you it's even worse in a column in the first time of COVID, uh, we were described as dead wood that wood could be shot. And that's so much uh, contrary of how we feel that we live our lives and that we give a contribution to society. But it's ageism in the most worse way. Age discrimination is a different story. For instance, when I became 75, I discovered that my car insurance has increased. Since more than 40 years, I never had uh, a claim for the insurance, but uh, it turned out that some insurance companies, as well as mine, uh, do increase this because of my age. You can understand I changed my insurance. Second example, some banks do not grant a loan, new loan or a change in the mortgage for persons over 70, even if their income is sufficient enough. Age discrimination can be brought to the Council of Human Rights in our country. Ageism is more sneaky and wrapped in words. Uh, it's special that for young ones we use the word already. He or she can do this already. For older persons, we use the word still. Do you still bike? Do you still drive a car? Are you still involved in boards of, or task forces? Do you still work as a volunteer? Well, now I draw your attention to this. I really hope that you hear it in the future and avoid it. Because 
getting aware of some mechanisms in the, is the first step for a change. I thank you so much for your attention and I'm looking forward to hear all the other experiences in this seminar. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Joke. And uh, I know that Francisco Trigueros joined. Um, it would be great if he could then keep on with the moderation and um, introduce the next uh, speakers and a few questions that we have for them. Okay. One moment, please. Um, not very clear on who's doing the spoken translation. Was that also the IS interpreters, or will you, do you have your own interpreter? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> We didn't hear it. Yeah. OK, I'm going to start again. I'm Fran. I'm going to moderate this session. I would like to introduce you Sanja Takhtai. She is the founder and the president of the Association of the Different People in Croatia. So please, Sandra, you have five minutes. I'm the president of the World Federation of the Deaf. A World Federation of the Deaf Blind, sorry. Okay. Uh, greetings to everyone. As you already heard, Frank presented me, but he didn't show my sign name, so this is Sanya for everyone who is using the sign language. He didn't mention also that I am 55 years old. I still feel young though, but I'm very lucky that I decided to include in these activities on time because I realized how important is to ensure dignified old age. In this moment, I present a World Federation of Deaf Blind. And I will say in short that World Federation of Deaf Blind is a world organization, global organization. You all know that that's an organization that is by and for the deaf blind. It helps them and they work with the deaf blind. They can, the deaf blind can include actively in the activities. It's very important that this organization Uh, promotes the quality of life of the deaf blind and protects the basic human rights of specifically uh, of, of the specific and distinct group of people with disabilities, the deaf blind. You all know that World Federation of the Deaf Blind is uh, finance, uh, their projects are financed by European Union and concretely we're talking about shapes at the moment. That makes possible to all the deaf blind 
to increase their visibility. And as, a, as individuals and as a group. Also, we can coordinate and invite and include more deafblind persons that are of old age. We can also encourage them to actively participate. And I think that's the key in this project. Now, we have one specific role as a world organization of that line, and that's that we have rich knowledge and understanding of the specific needs of the deaf blind persons in the world, especially in the area of Europe. That's why World Federation of the Deaf Blind also coordinates with other representatives of the deaf blind, like European Deaf Blind Union. And the EDBU also controls the European situation in the coordination with the uh, World Federation of the Deaf Blind, and it makes possible to include. You also probably want to hear my experience on which way the deaf blind face the old age and what are the challenges. You all need to realize that deaf blindness is the one of the greatest challenges you can imagine. We I I fight every day to be equal, to be included. And now I'm getting also older and I need to think every day how to fight it and how to overcome the barriers. Not, a lot of people is, are not well known with the fact how the deaf blind person lives. Now, a lot of people didn't understand that, uh, that there is deaf blindness that is acquired and the deaf and the deaf blind group of people that are getting older. So they're coping with the uh, problems differently and it's pretty hard. But still, we have the biggest problem, not just for me, but for every deaf blind. When we start getting old, the first problem is there is not, not enough adequate support for the deaf blind persons. And the older people, are staying and are remaining misunderstood. Also, a lot of uh, researches show that a lot of people uh, of deaf blind are older, two thirds of the deaf blind are older. So it's important to include the older deaf blind into the researches. Uh, research, a, a qualitative researcher. A research uh, I'm sorry, Sanja. Uh, please. It's almost the time. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Now I would like to give the word to Mark. 
Mark Wigley, he's the executive director of the European Union of Deaf. So please, Mark, you have five minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And thank you for inviting us to present today. EUD represents 150 countries, the EU plus Switzerland and Norway and the UK. However, I'm going to focus on issues pertaining to sign language user issues and the barriers that they face. And more importantly, we're going to look at the barriers that there are. However, we also need to look more specifically at the barriers that deaf people that are also aging face. And these are even larger. And we want to look at how we can break through these barriers. The first step and the most important step is to ask the deaf senior citizens themselves. We can't just assume what they need. We need to truly go to the community themselves, ask them what their experiences are, ask them what are the issues that they bump up against, and we need to work with them. One issue that has come up again and again is actually is social isolation. The way people deaf communicate, because they use sign language, they have issues in social isolation. And the deaf blind community, this hits them even more drastically. And this is very hard to measure. How can you measure the amount of social isolation one faces? When we're looking at the elderly population, how do we even start to work together with them. If they're already isolated, how do we reach them? So I think we have to look at strategies on how to include those that are isolated and make sure that we reach out to them. Currently looking at data of the elderly population that is deaf is unfortunately not disaggregated. We need to make sure, we do know that the disabled community is a very wide range of disabilities with a very wide range of needs. However, we need specific deaf, deaf blind elderly statistics to find out how many people are we talking about. Once we have the appropriate data, we can really hone in our help for them. So within the SHAPES program uh, project, there is not many professionals that actually know a lot about the deaf, deaf blind community or about sign language users. This causes many family members of people that are deaf and deaf blind and elderly uh, to be more burdened. Because there are not as many professionals that can work with this group, we need to make sure that there's training for the professionals and that will decrease then the burden on the, on the family. So when looking at technology, what's great within the SHAPES project, we're looking at how we can support this community in a natural way. So that deaf and deafblind people in all of Europe, because that's quite a number, Mark, one minute, I'm sorry. Yes, and my last comment is <clears throat> that we are very happy that we are able to share our everyday experiences. So as experienced users, uh, you don't have to think of what uh, the possible issues are. You have come to us and we can share our experience with you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. The time has been perfect. Thank you. I would like to start 
let's see the audience if they have some questions but please it should be uh, short quickly we have 10 minutes okay. so let's see Yes, we seem to have one, well, at least one person raised his hand, but I couldn't get who he was. And now the, ran, the, the hand has been lowered. Oh. Anyone with any question or comment? I see now Mac raising his hand. So, Mac, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Alina, and um, thanks to, to Mark and uh, Sanja and uh, Joke. I ha had a question. Um, um, I think, uh, Joke, that you, you made a very interesting distinction between uh, age discrimination, and I think you said in your country you had a, a, a Council on Human Rights that can, if you like, have a legal approach to it. Uh, but then you said there was something more sneaky um, and that was ageism. Um, and of course, um, I, th I think the question then is, because it's certainly true that legal responses don't get away with, um, can cannot counteract, if you like, the sneaky part, the, the sort of implicit negative bias. Um, so I just wondered whether you had any particular experience or recommendations about you know what's the most powerful way of countering this more uh, sneaky sort of implicit uh, bias that might be within the law or or outside the law uh, thank you for your uh, answer Mac, uh, for your question Mac that's that's really hard because uh, it's it's well embedded in society to have a view of what it means to get older. Uh, in older, something of useless. And I like I wanted uh, I um, useless uh, care uh, misery. Mm. That's uh, sometimes uh, uh, the under tone in the in the debate but it's very hard the best thing is i guess that we all the older persons women and men just act like we do and uh, i know that our families uh, are very grateful for the support we give them i know that um, if we only one day that would be wonderful only one day not uh, do our our volunteer jobs everything we do in society it um well that would be a problem isn't it we had just the autumn leaf and you see far more extra uh, grandparents just filling a gap uh, it, but it's not only about parents and grandparents because a lot of people do do not have them but they also fill in their their lives with with uh, caring for the neighbor for what if we stop one day perhaps then society realize what we are doing but i think it's it's a sneaky uh, little thing of language of behavior of the way uh, 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 the public the, the publications uh, television mm -hmm. yeah so it's um it's not easy. So uh, but I'm sorry, the time. Yeah. Thank you. It's so I'm sorry, but the time has passed already. So thank you. If you have anything else, please just something quickly. One minute. 
I think Malati <clears throat> would like to have the floor. Okay. Uh, thank you, panelists and organizers. As a sociologist, I feel that social isolation is an issue across all the ages. And for this particular uh, uh, segment, which cohort of population which they are talking, it becomes more vulnerable. My question to the panelists, other speakers are, have they tried any self-innovative methods through technology to minimize the social isolation by themselves? Because their resilience building is so strong. Thank you. Would you like to answer to this question, some of you? Mark says I would. If okay. I'm very short, and then Sanya. Fast, please. Sanya, <laughs> Sanya you time. go first. Sanya, you can go first. The thing that I'm trying to do to reduce the isolation as a deafblind person is ensuring specific services to the older to meet their needs. But that's not enough because the government does not recognize the specific deafblind needs. The other thing is that the assistive technology is pretty expensive and it's not government funded. So that's very hard to get and to reduce the isolation on that way. So for that, we didn't find a solution yet. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Any other question? Yes, Mark will just to add his short comment. Okay, Mark. Like what has been said until now. We definitely need to make sure we add the views of the older people themselves. And within the SHAPES project, we also are looking at ethics. We are looking to really make sure we understand their needs. There are so many projects uh, for the deaf and the deaf blind, and they really have no idea what our needs really are. They don't know sign language. They make decisions without the community. So that's what's really great about uh, this project. But in, when I brought up social isolation, it just meant that this has come up in our studies. And that's what's great that we can bring back to shapes to make sure we find solutions. But currently, we're still at the informational bit. Uh, can I say something? Okay. Is the last one because we have one. Can I can I say something? Sí, sí, go ahead. You can go ahead, you okay? Oh yes, thank you. Um yeah, perhaps we are we are the lucky ones in in the Netherlands. But two years ago, um, uh, our Minister of Health uh, launched a program on on social uh, uh, on loneliness, loneliness, and it's in a way it's kind 
success because over 200 count, um, local councils commit themselves. And in the week of uh, lonely, loneliness, um, quite a huge program of, of the Netherlands is rolled out to encourage people to uh, see that this is going on and do something about it. So, um, yes, perhaps we're, we're the fortunate uh, ones. And I realize, for, because of my, the care for my sister-in-law, uh, in how uh, hard it is to, to get involved to society if you barely can see people and they didn't, didn't realize <clears throat> what your, your issue uh, is. So I think it's, we have to work on that very, very hard. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joke. The time is just now. Thank you, all of you. This is a very important uh, topic to work. Thank you. And I wish you all luck and encourage you to still work. Thank you, Elenia. I give the floor back to Elenia. And I give you the floor, I give the floor to the next. Thank you very much. Thank you to all panelists and to Francisco and everyone. And indeed, we can now give the floor to Professor Jemi Saris from the main North University. I should have been able to put you under the spotlight. Um, Jemi will be animating and moderating uh, an interesting and loving session focusing on the life world of individuals as we call it call them and uh, their impact on the research in shapes uh, jamie the floor is yours thank you linia and uh thank you very much uh age platform europe and uh this very distinguished audience for showing up today um i want to talk uh, very briefly about um the section that's that's coming up um, I just want to make sure who's going to be advancing the slides. Can I? Are you? Oh, is that you. going to be you? You will be Eleni. That's great. Okay. <coughs> that all important logistical question when you have multiple uh, presenters. Um, the uh, uh, task 2.1 of, of shapes: uh, understanding older persons' lives, communities, and contexts. Uh, that uh, you're going to be hearing over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes, um, some of the case studies that we have been developing over the course of the last uh, 18 months or so. Uh, this part of the project is led by David Prendergast and myself. You'll hear David presenting in the body of the piece. And uh, Katya Seidel is our senior postdoctoral fellow and John Foley is our research assistant. So I wanna thank all of them. Um, and you can see the, the research team, most of whom will be uh, talking in the period that uh, coming up. Um, this task was uh, charged with exploring life worlds of older people in Europe. And you could say our beginnings were quite inauspicious as our original data gathering plan required us to visit older persons in the several pilot sites over a couple of days in their homes beginning of March, 2020. Uh, then of course, COVID lockdowns uh, started in earnest so part of the, uh, a lot of the, the data gathering was done under the ages of COVID and COVID sort of exposed uh, certain uh, issues such as, for example, social isolation and how care systems uh, operated and were stressed. At the same time, it also exposed certain strengths in communities and in care systems. Um, in any case, the COVID necessitated a complete reformulation of our work uh, we had to switch to remote interactions uh, and also required us to train up local researchers to collect the data. Uh, this was certainly uh, an adjustment, even a struggle, but it did provide some opportunities for the project and for shapes as a whole, such as increasing the number of informants, uh, interacting with them over a much longer period of time, uh, several weeks, and in some cases, several months. And in many cases, it allowed us to develop considerably more extensive information on their life histories current living situation, 
and hopes and anxieties about the future. And see, indeed, so productive did we feel that these case studies to be that we argued uh, that both the shapes ecology as a whole, as well as external parties, would benefit from these insights uh, long before the uh, actual report, which we're writing up now, was actually due. So we began to abstract them, combine them with photos um, of, that older people themselves provided, as well as some supplementary readings. And we created a section of the shapes website uh, called uh, hashtag shape stories. So if you go on the website and you look at the top uh, menu, you will see that and you will see many cases like the ones that we're going to be detailing here. To date, we have developed 93 case studies and 89 households representing eight countries. And I just want to lay out one or two kind of uh, um, definitions and kind of broad um, areas to just think through. First of all, life worlds are more than subjective or anecdotal. They are shaped by broader social, cultural, technological, political, and economic forces. And they also provide insight, insights and sometimes critiques of those processes. The second kind of principle in this kind of research, it's, it's axiomatic in anthropology, but it connects to a lot of sociology and uh, human geography and other disciplines. People are an expert if not the sole expert in their lives, they are the key part to any understanding of their own health and well-being um, and indeed their own needs. And finally, there's a wide range of technology use amongst older people already, from those as adept at people decades or junior on their smartphones or using social media to keep track of and gain support from family and friends through people who use practically none. So the image of the technophobic older person is something that we definitely want to try to uh, uh, get rid of. So what I want to do now um, is uh, turn over the, uh, the floor to the presenters. Uh, we're going to start off with Marquetta. Um, and the title of this case study is, And Now I Am Scared, Delay, Delay and Avoidance in Uncertain Times. So Marquetta, go ahead. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, today I would like to share with you a case study about Julie. Uh, Julie is 87 years old. She's a widower and she lives in a middle-sized city in the Czech Republic. We met almost a year ago uh, online through Skype because of uh, COVID restrictions. And uh, we talked a bit about how Julie lives and uh, I chose today uh, to share with you how COVID impacted her, her life. Uh, but at the beginning, I just want to uh, share um, a bit more about Julie. And uh, she, Julie is a very cheerful person. So when I met her, when we got to talk, uh, she was always the optimistic one. So even though uh, she encountered uh, many problems or challenges in her life, um, for example, she took care of her husband uh, until his last days. Uh, he passed away seven years ago, so even when she was uh, 80 years old, she was taking care of him and he wasn't able to move, so uh, it was a great challenge for her, uh, but when we were discussing it, she was mentioning that she wouldn't change a thing uh, because their uh, relationship was very loving and kind, and uh, she was happy that she was able to be there uh, for him. Uh, at the moment, Julie uh, lives alone, uh, but she has a family that's caring her, for her a lot. Uh, they help her to do groceries, to visit doctors or take her away for uh, short trips. And she also loves to read. Uh, she loves to be online. She loves to use uh, the internet and also call her friends through uh, Skype or uh, other, other media. And uh, when I met her, uh, we can go to the next slide, Elenia. Um, and as I was describing, as she was quite an optimistic and, and bright person, uh, she was sharing with me how, uh, despite her, let's say, mental health and her optimism, her body is breaking, which was a sentence that really struck me. And then um, she probed a bit more and she was sharing how uh, in the last 10 years, uh, she went through uh, five surgeries, her veins needed to be fixed, her knee was replaced, uh, and she also required uh, to go through a hysterectomy. And last year, uh, they found a melanoma in her shoulder. 
So despite her uh, well-being, um, let's say mental well-being, her body uh, decided otherwise. And uh, due to all these problems that she encountered, uh, she has to see doctors for uh, regular checkups, uh, even four doctors within three months. In total, she's seeing around seven specialists to care for her um, problems, uh, health problems. And uh, she's seeing like ophthalmologists, dermatologists, and, and many others. And when COVID happened uh, last March, her family uh, decided, one of her daughter decided that she really wants to provide her a safe space and also self-isolate themselves. So uh, she took Julie and her family uh, to a cottage. Uh, there is a picture of a cottage. It's probably not Czech Republic, but it's just a, a nice uh, for you to picture. It was really in the middle of nowhere. And Julie was describing this time as, uh, as a blessing, as a great moment in her life uh, when she could spend really the time with the family, be with them, and also uh, take care of her great granddaughter who is two years old. So whenever Julie was mentioning this, she was smiling and uh, she was very, very happy. However, uh, because they went away for a couple of months uh, when she went back uh, last um, autumn, uh, she had to face the reality that she has to see the doctors. She has to go to the hospital. She has to go to the clinics. And uh, for her, that has become um, a real challenge. Um, she was sharing with me how she is scared, how uh, she is trying to follow all the restrictions, really wear the mask, keep the social distancing, um, use the hand sanitizers and so on and so on. But when she goes to the hospital, there are many people who just don't follow, for example, these rules. All she has to wait there for a long time. So, uh, she was sharing how challenging it is, how fearful these moments are when she just has to go uh, out and she has to wait for her appointment. And uh, even though she tried to stay cheerful, these, every time she had to go out, uh, it was um, taking her down, uh, letting her down, let's say. And um, that's maybe what I also want to point out here. Um, after I, how I encountered Julie, who was really into technology, or um, she was really uh, curious of what we are actually doing in shapes and how she can, uh, you know, interact. Uh, that uh, shapes can provide uh, some solutions, for, for example, for these times uh, when there is a lot of uncertainty, when there is a lot of fear, not only among older adults, but in the whole society. Uh, to really give them some uh, ways how to stay independent, how to protect themselves and how to uh, stay well um, mentally and also physically. So this was my piece about Julie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marketa. Um, I want to give the floor over to uh, David Prendergrass to continue the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully you can hear me well. Uh, so my chosen story today is an account from a remarkable participant in Northern Ireland on the subject of mobility, uh, call this piece tra uh, Trains, Planes and Mobility Scooters. Monica is a retired school te uh, teacher in her late 70s, living by the sea in a small village a short distance from Belfast. Although poor health and a degenerative spinal condition has stolen much of her height and mobility, her charismatic personality is, in, is undimished. She has an inquiring mind and precise diction, coupled with the ability to switch at will between a cheerful disposition and a commanding manner, which promises a rapid education for those who make the mistake of underestimating her or patronising her. A bus driver learned this lesson the hard way. Monica, Monica recalls struggling to board an empty bus at the start of its route with her rollator walker full of shopping pointing to the sticker of a wheelchair proclaiming the accessibility merits of the vehicle monica asked the driver to lower the ramp and was met with a curt refusal that's only for wheelchairs she was informed after some struggle to embark she managed to get on board the bus and a stern lecture ensued i sat down in the front seat and i told him strongly but politely what he had done wrong well i said you know 
I've got two solicitors in my family and I do know what's right. And I think you're being very foolish to be so un uninformed about this, she said. On this occasion, an apology issued from the Chaston driver, but Monica has not always been so successful on public transport. In general, however, over the course of her gradual deterioration, she has found that most people are, not, uh, are only too pleased to provide assistance as long as you make direct requests in an unembarrassed manner and treat them as if they are a favoured relative from the outset. Monica's histories with mobility aids uh, is a string of often uh, humorously told uh, tales of experiments uh, of falls, dead batteries and burned out motors. Her, her ability to manage with just a walker as an, as an assisted aid has now long passed. Monica first used a mobility scooter in England, rented by her daughter. She loved it so much that her family bought and shipped the machine to her in Ireland at great expense. Having never driven a car, it, is, it was not early, easy for her to learn, especially in negotiating uh, tight areas and backing up. Her first proud adventure in it was into a village and it ended with her being trapped at the edge of a road curb after a miscalculation over its height. The scooter died and she had to call a friend to tow her home, only occasionally bashing into the back of his car due to the lack of on onboard brakes. Back home, she tried to fix it, initially replacing its batteries, but was informed by experts that her new scooter was beyond repair. Now, undeterred by the death of her first scooter, and an avid fan of eBay, another online second-hand sales website, Monica has now compiled an env enviable garage on mobility aids. Her next scooter was smaller but sturdy. That is un until she drove it down the garden where the wheels got stuck in the soft earth and it tipped her into her hydrangea hedge. Her subsequent purchase was a much bigger machine with headlights and indicators. She could not believe her luck as she managed to buy it very cheaply for 600 pounds from an older lady who had moved into sheltered accommodation with two rooms that were too small to fit and to host such a robust device. Monica also bought herself a powerful electric wheelchair with independently driven large wheels. It was her equivalence of a four by four off-road vehicle so that she can join her daughter on long hikes, uh, hikes and countryside walks. This has carried her up and down steep hills and rocky pathways in forests and sites such as Giant's Causeway, but she learned the hard way not to use it in the city. Uneven pavements with curbs send the wheels in different directions and steering becomes difficult, dangerous with so many people around. People reading their mobile phones, inattentive to their surroundings, walk into the back of the chair or force her to suddenly break, risking injury to all. Monica says, I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to drive a wheelchair in the city again. It's much easier on a mobility scooter if you're going through a crowd of pe uh, people. At least I found that because you have got the small driving part in front of you, the bit that comes up, a bit of metal and something to hold on to, whereas in a wheelchair, you're exposed. Navigating other forms of public transport rarely causes Monica trouble. Although she notes that small train stops or halts without proper stations can be very difficult to, to traverse in Northern Ireland. Trains are usually well set up for people with wheelchairs and the staff tend to be accommodating and well-trained. The secret, she explains, is to always do your research on the internet or even better, call ahead on the telephone and alert them to your times and points on your journey. A keen traveller, Monica has always enjoyed, uh, enjoyed travelling on planes and, all, and argues that no one disabled should worry about going through airports. Trips to her children in Europe, the Middle East and Australia has given her extensive experience negotiating assistance to the gate. The support and attention can vary according to how busy the staff are, but she says she always has, to quote, a bit of crack with the people pushing her and suggests that I never feel I'm sort of like a weak invalid or anything silly. No, I don't feel that way. Eager to help others, Monica wants it to be widely known that it is free to take wheelchairs or scooters on planes. I've traveled by plane a lot since I've been uh, really unable to walk very far and the airports are wonderful. Um, they put my vehicle in the hold <coughs> and bring the batteries in with the pilot. You can ride your wheelchair to the foot of the steps in the UK and you can wait for the steps. 
if you can't walk at all, they'll take you in another wheelchair, to, uh, in a lift, up to the cabin, and they don't want you to sit in your own wheelchair in the plane, even if it's booked for you. I suppose it would block the way. Now, grounded uh, by COVID-19, Monica is avoiding planes, trains, and buses alike, keeping herself busy with reading, writing, her garden, her much-loved iPad, and a few close friends and carers. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, I want to give it over now to uh, Rania, please. Good morning from me. Yes. Well, I'm going to talk. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, weight in matters and changing habits in later life. Um, in uh, the photo on the right, we see Elena, a 69 years old lady from a small village in Greece in the place where she spends most of the day cooking and meeting uh, her friends. Elena lost her husband 10 years ago. Now she lives in a village in central Greece, close to her married daughter. Her other child, her son, lives with his wife and her two grandchildren in a nearby village. Elena is now retired and feels she has a comfortable economic situation and is able to sometimes help out her daughter financially. Earlier in life, Elena and her family live in Germany for many years. When they returned to Greece, they set up a shop based on the ground floor of their house where she worked as a cook. After her husband's death, Helena stopped working, working and converted this space as a place to meet her friends, have coffee and to make sweets and pies for the ladies club. In retirement, she says, I love cooking for family and friends. Unfortunately, since the onset of COVID-19, she is no longer to host these meetings with her friends. These days, Elena lives alone on the top floor of her two-story terraced house. Climbing the stairs has become a serious challenge. Obese at 120 kilos and a smoker who enjoys 10 cigarettes a day, she has been diagnosed with neosteoarthritis and suffers from lower back pain for which she takes daily painkillers. After a few recent unpleasant falls, Elena developed the fear of falling over, so she decided to limit her movements. This bothers her because it prevents her from going on trips to monasteries with her friends. Elena also suffers from a number of other serious health problems. She has been diagnosed with heart failure, atrial fibrillation, hyperlipidemia, obstructive sleep apnea, and depression. Every month, she, she visits her GP for her medicine prescription. Although her doctor advises her to stop smoking, control her eating, and to exercise, she doesn't follow the medical guidance. Elena also pays an annual visit to a cardiologist and a pulmonologist because of the obstructive sleep apnea. A pulmonologist prescribed the CPAP machine, which she has been using now for four years, in order to improve her sleep quality. Elena is well aware that many of her health issues could be alleviated if she could lose weight. She is also at risk of developing diabetes in the future, which will complicate her health condition. On several occasions, attempts to lose weight have been useful. After trying, um, after trying on her own, Elena resorted to spending money from her patient to secure the services of a dietitian, but she has still not managed to meet her weight loss ambitions. This situation is likely exacerbated by her, reducing mobility due to fear of falls. When asked how technologies could assist, she suggests an electronic box that would check all my health problems and inform me of my health condition. As important as advances in how to monitor and manage her chronic diseases and health conditions at home, clear real to Elena, her lived experience also reminds us of the value of technologies that would help bolster her confidence with walking and movement, as well as helping identify, track, and encourage her progress with weight loss goals. Things were further complicated in Elena's life when she experienced a serious episode of depression three years ago following the deaths of her husband and sister. For a long time, she did not go out of the house. She was not in the mood to do the housework. So she did not meet her friends. She visited a psychiatrist, so diagnosed with her with depression, and since then, she has received medication. Despite these accumulated physical and mental health problems, Elena is a lively person who loves life. 
She regularly volunteers for the church charity and she likes knitting. She continues to drive and likes small trips with her friends in nearby villages. Looking into the future, Elena wants to be in good health and dreams of being able to travel all over the world. Thank you, Rania. Uh, um, some, uh, sorry, David, to read uh, also that. Some notes to keep from this story is that the elderly often suffer from more than one disease, uh, the multimorbidity. Falls among the older population are common and costly and can have a significant burden on their physical and social life. And modification of risk factors for non communicable diseases can have a positive impact on the quality of life of the elderly. Thank you. Thanks, Rania. All right, Lucia. Hello, everybody. Um, Alegría, which means joy in Spanish, is a 72-year-old woman born and raised in the Canary Islands, Spain. She has lived and traveled around the world and speaks four languages. Alegría is also a woman with deaf blindness. This means that she's almost completely blind, but hears well enough with a hearing aid as long as there is no background noise and she is spoken to loudly and clearly. Alegría often meets with guide interpreters who assist her when she needs to go to the bank, to the hospital, and other everyday activities outside the home. The role of guide interpreters is key to communicate and also to overcome the barriers she experiences in her daily life. These challenges have been worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. For instance, with the use of face masks or plexiglass screens that can be found at shop counters, which makes it hard to hear and be heard. To navigate, Alegría uses a red and white cane, which is shown on the slide, which is the universal symbol that indicates that she's a person with deaf blindness, or in other words, that she has both a visual and a hearing impairment. Alegría emphasizes the importance of raising awareness about the red and white cane because it can really, really make a difference when interacting with other pedestrians, hospital staff or society in general. She says, many times I have had to explain to the doctors the meaning of the red and white cane because they did not know. I do not think that many people know what it means to be a person with a deaf blindness as a joint disability. Alegría is also a cancer survivor, having recovered from two breast and one bladder cancer. And she has a son who is a wheelchair user. Alegría supports her son financially as the state or the national health insurance do not cover many of his expenses. She says that he does not even get a hoist to be able to get out of bed, which he needs. I had to buy it for him because he does not receive any help at all. I also buy him a wheelchair every four years because after two years, it is completely worn out. Alegría loves to read novels in audiobook format and she uses her iPhone daily. CD, which serves as a screen reader, helps her navigate its functions and content. Also, Alexa, Amazon's voice assistant, has also proven to be very useful for checking the weather, turning on the TV, or playing music. While these digital technologies have made her life easier and helped her stay independent, mobility is still the main challenge. When Alegría goes out on her own, she uses a pedestrian device, which is also shown in the slide, which when activated makes an acoustic noise to indicate when it is safe for her to cross the road. However, most traffic lights in her area do not have the system activated. The traffic light nearest to her home did some years ago. However, the creation of a bike lane resulted in the deactivation of the system. This means that she cannot cross the, the, cross the, um, the area independently. Uh, Alegría says that it was requested like 20 times by ONCE, the Spanish National Organization of the Blind, to get it back after they built the bike lane. However, they did nothing. The lack of availability of this service means a lack of autonomy and independence for Alegría as her freedom is now severely restricted, her freedom of movement. She explains, so now I have to wait for someone to cross and if there is someone who really wants to help me, otherwise I cannot access the pedestrian area. 
she also mentions that badly parked bikes and scooters and cars have increased her physical impediments to successful navigation. She says it can either be a small van, construction work, but other pedestrians in general are quite kind and warm. The main buyers are the bikes and the scooters that are badly parked or riding where they should. By sharing her story, Alegria would like to contest many stigmas around, the, around women with disabilities. She's a resilient and strong woman and an essential support person for her son. The main takeaways of the story can be one, that one of the main barriers for persons with deaf blindness is the lack of awareness on deaf blindness. For instance, what the red and white cane means, the role of guide interpreters, what it means to be a person with deaf blindness, et cetera. Two, that persons with deaf blindness must have access to personalized support service. They should have access to guide interpreters when they need it. They should have access to guide language interpreters if, if they're sign language users, et cetera. And three, technology is key for independence and communication. Therefore, it is essential to include the perspective of older persons with the blindness and persons with disabilities in general to ensure that technology meets also their needs and their requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Um, <coughs> Ariana? Good morning to everyone. I'm going to tell you the story of Donna who is a 92 years old Italian woman. When thinking about technologies, we often focus on how they can facilitate the doing of things, how they help us exercise and excite body and mind to communicate with other people, to watch movies or YouTube tutorials, or to get a service online. In societies and life worlds, where the pace of life seems to get ever faster, we sometimes forget about how it is important now and then to just stop and don't do things, but look, listen, reflect, and remember. Especially as people grow older and life stories lengthen, looking at who they have been, what they have done, and what is recalled fondly or otherwise represents a way to give significance to their present and to know that they are leaving something to other people in the future. During my research, there was a case where this concept was represented in a clear and touching way with a very whole woman who has perfectly learned to use our tablet to look every day at her photos of her family, and above all, of her beloved husband some years ago. During our meeting, she always wanted to show me a specific picture to illustrate the points she made. For her, images could better explain her meaning as she could let things come alive. A way of creating, sharing, and mutually experiencing a moment inside our past. She, like many of the older, older adults in our research, has a treasury of valuable embedded memories and a desire to share with those ready to listen. Donna is a 92 years old Italian woman. Her husband died six years ago after more than 50 years of marriage and she recalls an even longer almost perfect love story. They met each other at an art exhibition in Venice, the city of love, and they've always been together since then. They had two beautiful children and numerous nephews who still visit and enjoy spending time with her, sharing experiences and moments together. Memories are an important part of Donna's life as she is very fond of her family and remembering times with her husband where her, when her husband was alive and her children were younger makes her really happy. She spends a lot, of, a lot of time reading a book that her husband wrote about her life and looking at the letters that her children wrote to them when they were at school. But above all, she loves to look at photographs. Donna has tasks photographs covering all aspects of her life, starting from her early childhood. Every day there is a moment when Donna sits on her couch and takes time to visit her favorite images, remembering special memories. She doesn't always look at them alone. Donna likes to share these photos with her family, especially younger relatives ignorant of her earliest years, but also to other people that she talks to. For Donna, this sharing is a way to describe who she is, and who she was, not only now, but during all of her life, to show what she has lived in, in a deeper way, and an occasion to give them advice. Here there is a quote from her speech. I always say to my girls, 
especially to the youngest, I always say, when a man looks at you like this, like mine looked at me, that's the right one. It's a photo in the mountains. He has his hand on my shoulders and he's watching me. And it's a look, loving, let's put it in this way. That's it. Her family then gave Donna what she considers to be a huge gift. They gather all of her images and place them into a tablet where she can look at them whenever she pleases without wrestling with heavy albums. She no longer has to spend a lot of time searching for the specific photographs that she wants to see. Don explained that she has been given the possibility to take all of her memories with her wherever she goes and can now show her photos to everyone in an easy and efficient way. Despite her advanced years, she liked this tool so much that she took the effort not only to learn, but perfect how to use it. She's able to move from an album to another, to large photos, and to rapidly search and locate what she's looking for. Here there is another quote. I like to use the tablet much more than traditional albums because I can sit on the couch and go through all of my photos. I know where to go, which ones I want to see. I can always have my photo next to me to remember looking at my things, my memories. I can look at them whenever I want and I can do it faster than before. This is useful not only to look at it at and ignite her memories, but it also reassures Donna that her story and also her, her beloved husband's life will not be forgotten when she is no longer here. While photographs can be lost and ruined by time, decay or water, having all this material on different devices hollow her the legacy uh, to leave a legacy of heritage to her family. We will have the opportunity to know their roots and to continue building a common memory. Here there is another quote. While he was writing the book of his life, my husband always came to me asking about information. I knew everything about his ancestors, photos of his parents and uncles. So I knew everything about his life. So just to summarize, technology is not only about health, communication and services, all people need to keep their memories, look at them and share them with their friends and family by allowing others to know and enjoy such traces as to keep memories alive, even when those who created them are no longer on this art. It should not be underestimated how whole current and emerging technologies can create possibility to do so in new and accessible ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariana. Um, I'm gonna give the floor over now uh, to Katia. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Jamie and Ariana, of course, um, this was beautiful. Uh, I'm going to continue by telling you the story of Jutta, a 70-year-old social worker and adult educator from Dresden, Germany. Jutta, the mother of four girls, is a joyful and active woman with numerous roles and responsibilities. Jutta grew up in Middle Franconia, but moved with her family to Dresden after the reunification of Germany. Soon, Jutta's parents also settled nearby her house into a beautiful apartment with a garden. Life was good as Jutta found interesting work and with her warm and engaging character, quickly found friends and became well embedded in the neighborhood. At the age of 57, however, Jutta's life changed significantly. First, her 82-year-old father became weaker and was increasingly dependent on outside help. Then, Jutta went through a difficult time as her husband filed for divorce and her mother suffered a stroke that left her paralyzed on one side. With the children out of the house, Jutta spent every day of the next 13 years in her parents' home, helping her mother to wash herself, preparing breakfast and lunch, cleaning the flat, attending to her medical needs and running errands. Luckily, during the working, her working life, Jutta was able to observe how trained nurses deal with the physical needs of patients. This helped her when she became an informal caregiver herself, using her own body to help her aging parents get in or out of a chair, help them up after a fall, or to assist her father take a shower. Furthermore, technology has at least enabled some independence. There are these raised toilet seats, she tells me. As a result, my mother was able to go to the toilet on her own, as she didn't always plop down like that. The raised toilet seat has really helped a lot and has also preserved her dignity in this regard. Although Jutta and her mother were never particularly close, they now had to do everything together. 
including the daily walks to catch fresh air and keep the body active. And so while Jutta has no problem with the physical aspects of caregiving, she told me, for me, the real challenge was that I always felt I'm free. I was always on alert and ready to jump on every call. For years, she was used to drop everything, hop on her bike and drive to her parents' aid. And when the phone rang at 10 in the evening, she was alarmed and worried. Only once, only once they bought a wristband with an alarm button, which her mother wore at all times, she found some relief at night. The daily responsibility for her parents also changed her role as a grandmother because the grandchildren always had to come with her to her parents' apartment. It was good for them, she recalls, because that way they got to know their great grandparents well and might have a different view of older people. But for me, it wasn't always easy to keep the balancing act between these small active humans and two older, rather immobile adults, all in need of my attention. While the generational gap was an additional challenge, the proximity to children brought happiness and equilibrium to Utah and made it possible not to lose herself in the task of caregiving. As she says, I always looked for a counterpart to the oldies, something life affirming, something new, something young. You know, kids run around, jump and sing and are curious about everything. That makes me happy. That's how I regain the strength to keep going. The shared years with her mother and the, chain, and the chance to accompany her father until his last breath was also a positive experience. I have seen that death and dying is nothing to be scared about and that in the best case, you just slide away. For me, it was precious that I could experience it so directly. But I've also learned that aging is not for cowards. It's a very difficult thing. Well, it affects me now myself. A few months before our interviews, Jutta and her mother decided that it was no longer possible to continue with home care and that it would be better for her to move to a dedicated care institution. The 95-year-old mother now lives in a retirement home 500 kilometers from Dresden. That was my condition, Jutta tells me. If she moved, I wanted her to move further away, close to where my sister lives, because I wanted to leave behind the psychological burden, the constant state of tension that I experienced for years. You know, you don't realize it at first, but after a while you're trapped and your whole life is only that. I knew it was time to change. Knowing that her mother is well looked after, the 70 year old is now free to do what she wants. This is my first time being a pensioner. She says excitedly, as she wants to travel, visit her daughters and spontaneously accept invitations from friends. No longer a primary caregiver, she faces a time of adjustment, unknown freedom and new possibilities. What are you going to do now that you have so much time? Friends ask her regularly, often with an undertone of concern about how she will keep herself busy. Not sure about her next steps, but excited for the future, Jutta puts on a smile and says, I don't know, but what's so bad about having time? Jutta's story shows that informal caregiving is a crucial part of care systems in modern Europe. Especially older adults and women often take on the task of helping spouses, parents or adult children. However, their central role as social and cultural actors as volunteers, childminders and babysitters, community supporters and first responders in home care systems is little recognized and seldom appreciated. While technologies are useful in care practices, as the story has shown, older adults often play the key role and become the most important facilitators in processes in which others lose their independence. And so to prevent mental and physical exhaustion, that all too often result from these relationships. Person-centered care needs to ensure the well-being not only of the patients, but also of the ones helping them. Thank you. Thanks for that, Katya. Uh, great stuff. Thank you, Liana. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm impressed people kept as much time as well as they have. Um, I, I want to just sort of uh, have some concluding remarks and kind of act as a discussant, I suppose, on the fly. 
uh, to sort of maybe give some topics or, or, or broad areas that I think connect uh, these uh, very rich and interesting uh, presentations. The first and most obviously is that aging is complex. It is not a kind of medical condition, um, even if it can burden the body with increasing health issues. As Yoka pointed out earlier, stereotypes built around aging as a burden lead to discrimination, even ageism, closing off awareness of the immense value of older people in family and local care networks, a source of expertise based on decades of knowledge and experience, and being pillars of the volunteer community. But for the purposes of a, of a group like Shapes, even more seriously, these simplifications also make for bad thinking in research and bad policy in governance. We've experimented with multiple uh, alternative ways of thinking about aging, third age or successful aging, but none of them ever quite seem to get to the mark. And I think that that's one sort of broad area that, that we might talk about. The second broad area is the agency of older people and that all of these uh, uh, individuals, even the ones who, who are, are suffering seemingly under tremendous burdens, uh, exercise uh, uh, a relationship to their environment, uh, to their issues, and to their um, future <clears throat> that needs to be taken into account in any attempt to intervene in life worlds. Uh, the simplest way that it can be put, it, uh, to, especially to an audience of engineers, is that understand problems before coming up with solutions. The third is, I think, the broad area that, that connects these is that technology is not a simple idea, even when it can sometimes be technically simple. That is, in the, in the case of canes or toilet seats, which are technologies, but they are very long-standing ones, and they're often not considered uh, as such when talking about digital platforms and, and other kind of uh, seemingly more futuristic solutions to what's going on. Um, at the same time, the care system is as much in need of technology as our individuals and families in the sense that systems uh, from uh, the perspective of users very often seem needlessly complex, uh, almost perversely disjointed and end up um, being far less efficient uh, and cost far more than they need to with uh, if there were relatively simple tweaks that can be put together. And I think the, the fourth and, and kind of final broad area that I think should be of, of interest to shapes as a whole is, is there a European space for aging? Um, what does that mean exactly? Um, as someone who has, if you like, uh, become a European by choice and then moved from, from somewhere else uh, to live in the EU, I would have some ideas about that. But does that encompass certain ideas of, of culture, ethics, uh, social structure? So anyway, I want to leave enough time for discussion, so I'm going to open up the floor. Jamie, there was one hand raised and from Annabelle Isabel Martins, and uh, I see some Q and A's questions also. I see some Q and A's. Let's go to the raised hand first. Whoever has that, go ahead, uh, uh, Anna Isabel. Your microphone is off. Can we unmute? Anna? Okay. <laughs> we seem to be having a difficulty here. Sorry, I did it by mistake. I'm okay. so sorry. <laughs> no problem. I was trying to admit myself. I'm so <laughs> sorry. And congratulations to all your presentations. It was very interesting. Thank you. And sorry again. Okay. Is there? Do you have a question, or 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 is that? A, no, no. I no, I oh. must be. I must touch uh, something by mistake. I'm sorry. Okay. No. No. No problem. No problem. Um. All right. Valentini writes, uh, understand problems before coming to solutions is probably one of the most difficult things to point out in research and in real life practice. 
Um, as, as an anthropologist, Valentini, I can only agree with you uh, there. I, I think that one of the key principles of, of shapes that informs thinking about technology, thinking about socially appropriate uh, technology is precisely that, that too often uh, there is an endless uh, a series of solutions uh, to precisely the same problem that no one spends the time beforehand to really get their head around. Uh, Malati makes uh, an interesting point in the in the open chats um, about the, the caregivers in the case studies are themselves very often older people. Um, and this idea that uh, did they forget their aging issues because of their role as caretaker, I think that's a uh, that's an interesting point. I, I think that uh, uh, Yuta's case is um, you know a, a good example of that. That without um, that, while it was obviously a burden, particularly uh, that experience of being in a sandwich generation, having to raise children at the same time, care for uh, older relatives. Uh, that this is an extremely challenging uh, thing to actually accomplish, but by the same token, I, I think this is also, you know, it, it needs to be framed as the exercise of agency, um, the obvious uh, usefulness uh, of the work and the kind of immediacy of the reward to see somebody that you love being taken care of. I, I agree with that. Um, Anne-Marie? Anne-Marie, you have your hand up? Oh, Anne-Marie's hand went down, unless I lost Anne-Marie in the list. Okay. Um, Sorry, Jamie, if I may um, just add to what you were um, just responding yeah. to. Um, okay. In our research, it was also shown um, specifically about the, the question of, you know, do you forget your own age and uh, and what happens when, when people, older adults, uh, become caregivers themselves. Um, and a very interesting insight uh, also emerged from another case example, where a woman was telling me specifically about her experience of, of the next step, namely when her husband, whom she had cared for for four years, um, had died and passed away. And she was actually faced with the, the moment, um, or so to say, the problem of not knowing, sorry, I forgot my camera, um, of not quite knowing what to do with herself in that moment anymore. And that's when she took a next step and um, looked for volunteer jobs um, and started to educate herself um, in an adult university uh, environment. So to be, again, you know, um, having a purpose in life again after that episode, which was really kind of taking over all of her time. So I think that's a very important aspect to be thinking about when we're talking about older adult caregivers. Thanks. Okay. Um, I, I found the comment from Anne-Marie. I just will uh, read that or at least summarize that. Um, the fight of the risk of sneaky ageism. Uh, this is uh, directed to Yoka's uh, uh, work, uh, would part of a mitigation be shifting culture embedded in ageism with education at school and developing multi-generation experiences and opportunities? I think Yuta, the case, uh, Katya's case of Yuta is a good example of that, uh, that uh, relationship of um, uh, generations separ separated by a step, in this case, two steps, uh, you know, younger kids with, with uh, not just grandparents, but great grandparents which obviously has shifted dramatically over the course of the last several decades as families have, have gotten smaller um, and as age of first birth has, has relentlessly uh, gone up, that that experience of uh, young children regularly interacting uh, with a, a generation two above or, or three above has become much rarer. And that question about what kinds of communities uh, you know that whether that is you know housing, whether that is schemes like adopting grandparents, uh, welcoming kids in, into uh, elder clubs and uh, um, uh, spaces where older people congregate. I think that's a that's a very good point. I think that's something that that we you know by the nature of this work we haven't developed, but that's something I think shapes should definitely think about. 
Um, also, Dr. Fariel Idris uh, made an interesting uh, point, um, and uh, you know, talking about the various uh, uh, roles that uh, are fulfilled. You know, the doctor, lecturer, researcher, uh, member of a social organization, but the idea of religious uh, organizations, and this is something that uh, has um, there um, we, we've not had probably as much relationship to that. I think partly COVID because it um, constrained gatherings for religious services and obviously constrained gatherings around religious holidays um, has probably kind of uh, muted that from our data. I think that's something that we have to kind of think about a little bit more with respect to, you know, that just as COVID uh, restricted some things and opened up uh, other aspects of uh, of uh, connecting uh, with with these folks, that it did change the you know day to day, week to week, month to month kind of cycle of life, and sometimes that that isn't directly apparent uh, until you think about it in retrospect. So thank you for that. Thank you, Jamie. Just to add to that, there was yeah. an, an there was quite a lot of discussion in in our various case studies and in, uh, in the interviews about religion, um, spirituality, but also kind of about people's relationships with their church, especially at the point in countries where they were locking down and people could no longer go to church. Um, uh, and and the, the implications of that for people um, were, were, were very much discussed, as were the kind of functions that people were doing with their, with religious organizations in terms of volunteering, etc. So it's actually a really rich theme uh, within our uh, data, which we look forward to exploring as we, we get further into the, into the, the analysis. Okay, Malati has a comment uh, on, on the open forum. Um, why are we still delaying our efforts to include aging issues into the sustainable development goals, not just discrimination and exclusion, but a separate target and indicator? Uh, for example, we talk about uh, ESD for youth or those with the within the education setting, but such technology and learning by senior citizens contribute to SDG 4.7, where all age include learning and unlearning, and SDGs should cover all sections. I think that's an excellent point, and I, and I think that's probably... Um, without trivializing a, a, a sub issue of um, taking education or sorry taking age, aging um, as an obvious object and sort of ghettoizing uh, thinking of everything from training and education through issues let's say of social isolation and loneliness right through some of the other examples there that you know that the, the sustainable development goals are are you know should have aging as 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 uh, or should should sort of a fortiori include problems with aging and they don't and whether there needs to be a, a sustainable development goal specifically organized at aging given the the rapid you know it is a rapidly growing demographic in the world I think is a is an excellent point we have another hand up here uh, let me just find the hands oh no the hand disappeared <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was Mac. Uh, so that was Mac. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, the hand I, just, I just put it in the in the chat, Jimmy, instead. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, Mac, in case you tend to think of technologies being used to address deficits rather than building more directly on strengths, how can we? Yeah, I, th I think that's that's a that's a good approach, and I think there's probably a, a third, maybe broad category, of that is um, sort of bridging gaps that shouldn't exist where two parts of a system uh, are functioning, but mm -hmm. there should be kind of uh, some kind of gearing mechanism between them that is lacking. And I think and that, that's the kind of technology uh, that's, you know, usually beyond the level of, you know, the individual or even the household, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's some yeah. ways of getting basically to encourage what we all want, which is joined up thinking. Yeah, I think uh, Yoki just uh, said something very important there uh, in, in the chat. So getting old is one thing, the feeling no longer meaningful is the worst. And that is a theme that has come up in our research, uh, not just in this project, but, but for, for, you know, for, you know, in so many contexts, uh, you know, that, that ability to kind of feel like, you know, that you still uh, have, have a purpose. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for bringing, bringing that up. I think it's incredibly important. That is a great point.
Oh, uh, Yanet has a, a, a question on the open chat. How these case studies face stigma issues and self image changes and or reconstruction through their time using assistive devices in case where this information, in cases where this information has come out. Um, maybe I'll open that to the panel. Is there anything that comes to mind uh, from the specific cases that we were uh, discussing here? Yeah, I mean, and there'll be lots of people that can comment on on that. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I've I've found that um, you know in 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 the research that you know people will often um, resist using assistive devices for some time, you know, especially in public, and that it's often kind of phase use or a context kind of driven use. Um, but the idea, you know, I mean, uh, I remember what, interviewing one lady with Parkinson's and she really didn't want to use sticks outside the house because she, you know, there was a point of, uh, of the people in the community starting to see her in a different light. Um, so, you know, there was a point where she had to start using sticks, but she really did push, um, you know, kind of that point for as long as possible. Um, Katya, do you have anything to add to this question of stigma? Yeah, um, I mean, one of the things that also came at them very clearly is that, you know, uh, no matter uh, one's age, everybody has their own style, everybody has kind of the idea of how they want to look, how they want to be seen, how they kind of want to present themselves. Now, um, some of these devices, of course, interrupt um, your own style. Uh, so we've actually asked people about, you know, how do you dress? Um, what's your, what does your house look like, you know? Um, and um, probably more often with women than with men in this situation, you know, they wanted to have, say, if it was a wristband or a wristwatch, that that would kind of fit the color scheme um, that they usually are wearing. So things like that, you know, it's it often actually goes um, to very kind of fine grained details um, that really make a difference. Now, um, aware that there is a need, for example, to be using a wristwatch um, that would have an alarm button, it's still kind of people have told me, especially in one case, a woman has told me um, her complaint that it wasn't available in various colors um, and that she couldn't choose you know, the size of it uh, to fit her own body. So I think um, in the context of uh, designing these devices, it is very important to actually take into account that while people are older, um, they just look after themselves just as much as everybody else would want to. Uh, I want to keep their appearance uh, in that sense. So that will be one contribution, maybe. I'd also just add uh, Ever Chan's uh, point here, which is quite important. Uh, new digital assistive technologies are rapidly overcoming stigma issues. It is often fancy to use apparently innovative solutions. So just put that in there. Mm. Yeah, I, I I think that this is you know again kind of broadly absorbed under the rubric of dignity that that. Uh, people have, you know, a, a, a right in so much as possible to have some input into the image they present to the outside world. And I, I think there's a continuum from, you know, functions that are felt to be private, being kept private as possible to how one presents one's face when one goes out um, that the sensitive deployment of technology or very often making technology that is already available more sensitive to that kind of impulse is a very uh, is what the management people like to call a low lying fruit it is not a particularly uh, difficult or an expensive solution it is one susceptible to kind of just a little bit of imagination and a couple of tweaks Malati brings up, I'm happy that in India, sign language is introduced as a new syllabus in liberal education that is needed for everyone as you grow older to signify, communicate. Yes, uh, that, that I think is definitely true. I think this is one of the, the hugely powerful parts of shapes as a whole, but this database uh, in particular, it is very rare uh, to have not just such a large qualitative, you know, large number of 
of quite detailed qualitative cases as you've seen in, in uh, Work Package 2.1, but to seamlessly have integrated uh, people who are deaf and deaf blind in that as opposed to a separate project focusing on, on that as a, a particular kind of challenge. So I think that's a, that's a strength um, of, again, shapes as a whole, and it has really strengthened our own kind of research. Um, it's open. Thanks for sharing these. Thank you, Anna. Probably just, um, Jamie, if I may, yep. um, one more addition to the question that came up before uh, in terms of stigma and also the, the whole discourse of ageism. Um, also from another interview um, with a woman who is now in the age of 68, um, who has pointed out that um, what she likes the least is that old is often associated with bad or gone, you know, gone bad. Um, whereas she actually wants to highlight that old, you know, is valuable in itself. And she's not trying to look young. She's not trying to hide her age because having her age, she pointed out is like, you know, to get where I am, you first have to live to this point, you know, and manage to survive um, to my age. And she actually thought it's important to also highlight that we should look at old as valuable, just as vintage, um, as she has pointed out in many ways. And yeah, that was just, I think it's very valuable because very often it's the responses go along the line of, I still feel young, but yes, young at heart, um, when being old, I think is a wonderful thing. All right, are there any more questions? Um, Eliana, I'm not quite sure where we are on time. I don't think we're too bad, are we? You have been perfect. All of you have been great. <laughs> <laughs> only, only four minutes ahead, so we are able to accommodate another question if you want. Oh, okay. Well, the boss says we can have another question. Uh, all right, well, it's an important skill to know when to leave the party. So I would like to thank our audience uh, very much for their attention and for a, a really rich and interesting discussion. I, of course, want to thank again all of the presenters who uh, have uh, worked so long and hard and diligently in uh, Work Package 2.1 to get us to the point where we are now. And I want to thank again the uh, Age Platform Mirror and the organizers broadly for giving us the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you. Many thanks, Jamie and our colleagues. This has been very inspiring, at least for me. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, let's now break for a little 15 minutes and we'll be back at a quarter past uh, 12. See you in a while.
Okay. Time for the break is uh, is over. So I take uh, the lead from uh, Ilenia, from my colleague Ilenia, and um, we can now resume the the session, the workshop for the last uh, for the last part of it. Before you you can go for lunch, we we'll let you go. I will wait uh, thirty seconds just to make sure everyone can uh, take a seat uh, and, and and get back. Okay, then I will uh, I will continue with the with the session. Uh, I hope you had a refreshing, a little refreshing, refreshing break. Um, and now we are uh, getting together again uh, for the panel for the last panel, which we call "Understanding People's uh, Communities uh, and uh, Contexts." Um, when we were um, oh, there is some light. Okay, now it's fine. Um, when we were designing this uh, the agenda for this workshop. Uh, we realized uh, it was important uh, first to uh, put shapes in contact with uh, with uh, stakeholders and with all of you, with all participants, to present what shapes is up to and to reflect on the work we are doing and get your feedbacks, your comments, and exchange uh, with you all. And we also realized it was important to give the floor to uh, other uh, professionals that are currently working and fighting for a Europe uh, where people can live as equals. Uh, in their lives and this is why we um, thought uh, it would be nice to have external speakers presenting their own work in this workshop in this uh, last uh, part of our workshop so this is the sense of this uh, last part of this of this uh, dialogue workshop is to give the floor to those voices and to hear from the work others are doing to ensure europe is uh, a place where people can age uh, well and where people can live uh, as equals and in full dignity also in older age um, we have with us uh, two external speakers, two, ex two speakers we are very welcome, very happy to, to welcome. Uh, the first is Valentina uh, Polidas uh, from a European network of uh, regional uh, health, uh, health authorities, Eurega. And the other speaker is uh, Lotan Crown, uh, who's working uh, in the uh, Marie Curie uh, EU funded uh, project, Transsenior, doing research in a topic that is also very relevant for, uh, for shapes. Um, so I will first uh, give the floor to uh, to Valentina. Uh, Valentina, we are wondering what is the role of uh, local and regional uh, health authorities in ensuring people can uh, age in dignity, and also, uh, you know, any ideas you may have on uh, how uh, the members of your network could be interested and in, in use and the outcomes of uh, of shapes and the work we we are doing in the project. I give you the floor for the next uh, ten minutes, Valentina. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, also thanks to the organizer, the SHAPES project for this opportunity to share with you some inputs today from the perspective of the regional and local health authorities. I am the director indeed of this uh, Brussels-based association, URIGA, for those that didn't have uh, knowledge about us. Uh, we are representing regional health authorities in the um, debate on health at European level. At the moment, we have 20 members coming from 10 countries in Europe. Uh, so just to give an idea of who we are and why we are getting together. Well, we are getting together because we work uh, on sustainable and resilient health and social care systems. So it's important that I stress what is the angle for us also when we talk about aging. Uh, so it's, it's really important to say that our member are um, policymakers. Uh, so sometimes we represent um, a regional health and social care agency. Uh, sometimes we represent department of, of health in regions, but uh, all in all, according to the different competence within uh, each member states of the European Union, they are all uh, policymakers that can actually make choices when it comes to talk about health and social care systems. So, so this, I think it's, uh, it's an important disclaimer. And when I say that uh, we want to uh, have a sustainable and resilient health system across Europe, uh, we do have also a receipt for that, uh, which is uh, uh, a system which is people-centric, uh, based on value, 
and also outcome measurement. So we are working a lot on, uh, on all these topics, uh, which means also that we are focusing on uh, digital tools and integration of care. And those are all uh, activities that in a way are also linking to how we can uh, have you know, people in good health and active and healthy aging on the, on the long run. Um, in terms of uh, uh, where we fit with our action in the European framework, needless to say that of course, we are following the green paper on aging and especially when it comes to the green paper, uh, we are pretty much interested in uh, again, uh, the active and healthy aging part because the green paper is broader in scope uh, and we appreciate this uh, you know broader vision uh, but according to what we do this is uh, especially important for us uh, active and healthy aging long-term care and of course also fighting loneliness and social uh, isolation basically because those are all things that in a way are necessary to be tackled if we want to ensure uh, the sustainability of the health and social care systems. So from that point of view, uh, we also you know, uh, are pretty much interested in the silver economy uh, because we believe that a developed market of product and services for uh, healthy and active aging can improve this resilience of the health system that I'm talking about, basically. So this is a big focus for us. And of course, also the European the health data space is something that we are following. Uh, also, how to build this infrastructure at European level, how to share data. Those are all things that can have a, a huge impact also on aging. And uh, needless to say, skills. So we are also closely following uh, path for skills and uh, how to translate the right uh, digital skills to citizens, but also, of course, healthcare workforce, uh, because this is also something that it's uh, pretty much needed. Um, in order also to concretely develop uh, uh, activities, we are part of a European project, which is called Inforaha, uh, an innovation network for scaling active and healthy aging. And one of the tools that we have in Inforaha is uh, uh, the fact that we want to build upon the legacy of the AIP on AHA community, uh, and see what we can do together moving forward, let's say, in this programming period with this community, embedding also new, uh, let's say, stakeholders in a HAHA community at European level, meaning in particular um, stakeholders from supply and demand uh, side. And uh, beside that, the other point is uh, uh, that we are pretty much also interested in uh, cross-border scale-up of tested and ready-to-use application for AHA. Uh, the overall and ultimate goal of this in for AHA will be then really to come out with uh, solutions that are tested and of course validated by, from the stakeholders. And, uh, and all this complemented with a roadmap uh, with impact evaluation toolkit and a strategy for long-term investment uh, in this area. So those are the activities that we are uh, at the moment implementing with this project that could be also interesting, you know, to share with you with the SHAPES project. It, it would be great to have, you know, uh, more uh, uh, exchange uh, from, uh, from the different projects. Uh, so uh, I think that for my members at the moment, then this is really the priority. Uh, bring uh, the digital transition probably out of our hospitals and traditional community healthcare centers, but rather, you know, bring this digital transition where uh, elderly are, are living, uh, uh, home, community, neighborhood. Uh, and this is why we are pretty much interested in exploring all these solutions, solutions that are tested with the end users and so elderly people in this case, and that can really support uh, the topic I was mentioning at the beginning, meaning the uh, sustainability and the resilia of, resilience of the health uh, and social care systems. So this is a bit, uh, it's uh, at the moment, uh, the activities that uh, my association uh, is doing uh, at European level and with, uh, with, uh, with the members of UBIGA. And we, it, it, at the core, of course, there is the need for changing people's life uh, with the support of the overall ecosystems. And in this ecosystem approach, of course, we represent basically the policy maker, the regional health authority that should be the enablers for, uh, for this change.
Thank you, uh, Valentina. Thank you for your uh, your presentation. I think it's uh, really useful. Um, I think for shapes, it's really important uh, to liaise with policymakers and with uh, health authorities. Um, we believe that uh, what shapes is doing, what we are working on, will be relevant for policymakers. We need them to to be part of the conversation. So we are very happy to have you with uh, with us. You mentioned the idea of the ecosystem, and that's also part of SHAPE's work. We are trying to create linkages with all relevant stakeholders, and you are among those, uh, certainly. So I, I, I'm sure there will be chances to work together uh, further in the coming in the coming months and years. Um, so thanks. Um, I now give the floor to uh, the other speaker we have in this in this panel. And uh, this is uh, Lotan Lotan Crown. Um, so Lotan is part. Uh, it's a PhD student working in the EU-funded uh, program uh, Trans uh, Senior. He's also working with the White and and Yellow Cross in uh, in Flanders, in in Belgium. And his research uh, about empowerment of older people in care transitions is truly relevant for some of the work we are doing in, in shapes. Uh, we are also uh, trying to understand how uh, we can empower older people to make decisions about their own care. We have a specific task uh, dealing with this and we'll be drafting a, and delivering a report on this very specific issue. So we thought it would be great uh, to, to talk to Lotan, who's at the, at the moment also doing a secondment at Age Platform Europe, learn from his research and explore further cooperation in the in the future as well. So uh, Lotan, I want to give you the, the floor for your presentation. You have 10 minutes as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Borja. Uh, so yes, today actually I'm going to present you a little bit about uh, my PhD and a project uh, plan, and also some interesting findings about uh, senior citizens and informal caregivers uh, empowerment. So we can move to the next slide please yeah so just few words trans senior it's a network it's a, a european funded project a consortium uh, that includes uh, 12 different phd students in different uh, countries in europe next i'm lotan crown i am one of the phd students that focus on uh, the senior citizens empowerment uh, i split my time between ku leuven in belgium Ben Gurion University in Israel and the White and Yellow Cross in Belgium. So, as you know, uh, we know that in the near future and in the next decades, we expect a, a jump and increase in the life expectancy. And then we can also think that we will see more comorbidities. And as a result of that, more uh, need for long term care uh, services. These graphs are about Belgium, but it can be related also to the European numbers. Next, please. What is the rationale? Why is it important to investigate or to understand methods for empowerment? So first of all, transitional care is often poorly managed. So our uh, empowerment approach, specifically in this study, is about transitional care. But today we talk more about the aspect of empowerment. Senior citizens and informal caregivers are under-involved in decision-making making about their own care. So that's a very important point. And informal caregivers and senior citizens' empowerment is needed to optimize transitional care. So the gap of knowledge or the question is, how can we best empower them? And uh, let's see in the next slides, how can we make it? So thanks. This uh, research product is based on three main uh, concepts, transitional care, decision-making, and empowerment. And if we click uh, once again, we see the orange triangle that shows the overlap between the concepts. Uh, yeah, we can move on. <laughs> transitional care, just to make sure that we under understand each other and that we are in the same page. Transitional care in this project, which means a move of a senior citizen from point A to point B, for example, from hospital to a nursing home, a physical care transition. Next. Then what is empowerment? So empowerment uh, by the WHO uh, is the opportunity or the control of the senior citizen or of the other person about his own decision. So we can uh, see that empowerment and decision-making are linked. And in the next slide, we see uh, that patient empowerment is also uh, related uh, with uh, the decision-making process. So empowerment and decision-making are not really different, 
they are different concepts, but they are really interconnected uh, and related. Uh, so what is decision making? I'm sure that you all know, but just to again uh, put ourselves in the same page, when you are confronting a problem or a challenge, you have to take a decision. Then you think about possible path of the problem. Then you should think about different future events, this different conditions that are uh, evolving uh, your needs and your uh, decision making uh, processes. And uh, in healthcare, we talk a lot about shared decision making, that this is very related with the control of the patient, of the senior citizen uh, in the process. And here it's when the clinician and the senior citizen jointly take a decision in the healthcare setting. And they speak and talk about values, about preferences of the senior citizen. Next, please. <laughs> So what is the question? How to empower senior citizens and informal caregivers in transitional care decision-making? And the plan is, first of all, to conduct a systematic review. So this systematic review was conducted and I will show you the main findings today. After that, to conduct in-depth interviews to understand the views and the needs and experiences of senior citizens and informal caregivers in transitional care decision-making. After that, to conduct focus groups and nominal group techniques with the target population and also with healthcare professionals in order to ask the populations what are the methods for empowerment. We are not bringing uh, the ideas as researchers. We ask, we empower, we ask the uh, target population. And then we would like to conduct a, a limited pilot and to formulate a guidance tool to healthcare professionals and senior citizens and informal caregivers. So today we will just talk uh, shortly about the systematic review. Uh, the aim was to get an overview, international overview about experiences, views and needs of senior citizens and informal caregivers in empowerment in the setting of transitional care uh, decision-making. So we worked according to the PRISMA guidelines. Um, we can continue, please. Uh, this is the cover uh, page of the article. It's under a uh, review now in one of the journals. We can move. And we started with approximately 8,000 uh, records uh, that seems to be uh, relevant in some way to our topic. And we finished with only 22 qualitative articles that are really precisely uh, discussing uh, senior citizens and informal caregivers transitional care decision making. Um, we identify four different pathways of the transition, uh, but we can continue. And this is the main course of the presentation. So those are the main themes and ideas that we identified that we found. Uh, by the perspectives of senior citizens and informal caregivers when they um, faced a care transition. So they felt senior citizens, you can see it in the blue uh, boxes, uh, feelings of reduced autonomy and increased dependency. So uh, for example, they felt that the fact that they are getting older can impact the level or the degree of their participation. In the other box, we can see uh, the preferences of, uh, for involvement uh, in decision-making. So here we saw that part of the uh, studies report that senior citizens really wanted to be engaged and involved, that they wanted to, to be heard about the decision if they want to move to another uh, care setting or not. But on the other hand, other groups did not mention that they wanted, they felt maybe overwhelmed. Uh, other thing was the influence of the info of the sorry healthcare professionals. So healthcare professionals sometimes were very dominant, very strong, with some authority by the eyes of the senior citizens. But on the other hand, other uh, uh, reports and the um, articles um, reported that senior citizens prefer to rely on others. For example, uh, for example, on healthcare professionals. The support of informal caregivers, here we found the consensus between the articles that uh, most or yeah, all the articles reported that senior citizens like and wanted to have more support of informal caregivers. 
usually it was mentioned about daily activities and support, uh, but also emotional support. Uh, in the orange boxes, you can see the perspectives of, of uh, informal caregivers about the uh, care transitions. So they felt uh, that they want to be involved uh, in this process and they want to influence and advocate the senior citizens. So they really want to uh, encourage and help the senior citizen to take uh, better decisions. They felt, uh, on the other hand, a lot of burden of responsibility. They had a lot uh, to do with that. They had to um, be like the spokesperson sometimes of the senior citizen, but they felt uh, that with all these responsibilities is something that is very important uh, for them to do. Uh, and different barriers, I think that I will mention just one uh, that we identify more and more, and also after that in in-depth interviews, that, seen, that the informal caregivers want to take the best decision. They want really to make the optimal decision and that takes a lot of effort from them. We can continue, please. Yeah, you can run these titles because I, yeah, run, run, run. Yeah, thanks. So just to conclude, uh, we conducted a systematic review the next step that we already started is to analyze in-depth interviews that we conducted here in Belgium to really uh, understand the views and the needs of the target population and to compare it with uh, the systematic uh, review. We can move. Just to tell you about the interviews in few words that uh, they were conducted, they are very interesting. We are now analyzing the data and I would like maybe in the next webinar or event uh, to share with you more. And yeah, we can move. And that's it, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Lotan. Thank you. Um, very, very interesting uh, research. And it's really, as uh, said, um, in a way, it fits very well with some of the work we are doing in, in Shapes. And we had the chance already to, to have you, Lotan, over in one of the meetings uh, we organized for Shapes with uh, members of the network of Edge Platform Europe, with uh, with older uh, self-advocates and representatives of organizations of uh, older people on what empowerment means, what decision-making means, and these concepts are really important for us. Um, I wonder if there are already some questions maybe from uh, uh, participants, either for uh, Valentina or for, uh, or for uh, yourself. Um, I believe uh, there was a comment on actually from Alati. Uh, this is for you, Lotan, on what the nominal group technique is. Indeed, this is a bit technical. So if you can exp explain yeah, yeah. us uh, very shortly what that means. Yeah. So once we will finish with the focus groups uh, and we will have a, a list of ideas and list of uh, propositions of how to empower senior citizens and formal caregivers, we would like to rank these ideas. We as a research team, we will need to think and see the ideas and to say, wow, so much great ideas, but what is the most important? What is the most feasible? Then we will invite healthcare professionals, senior citizens and formal caregivers, and also uh, care representatives. And we will ask them in a nominal group technique way to rank these ideas. So I, I will not elaborate uh, much more, but just to say that the session start that you sit in a round table and then uh, you ask the participants about new ideas uh, and the, to add it to this list. And then uh, individually, each participant will rank uh, by importance and feasibility. And then you sum up all the results. And then you discuss again with your target uh, population if they agree or disagree with this ranking. Uh, so it's a way to prioritize uh, ideas. And in our case, methods for empowerment. We really like to give the senior citizens and the informal caregivers the floor to give the ideas, but also to prioritize. We don't want to see, ah, okay, we got 20 ideas. Now we will pick the ones that it's good for us. No, we want them to prioritize. Okay, I think it was uh, much clearer uh, now, uh, Lotan. Thank you. Um, I wonder if there are other, other, maybe other questions in the in the chat or any other reactions. Um, I was actually myself uh, wondering, uh, Valentina. Um, you know, uh, your remember your members are policymakers. Um, 
Well, I mean, there are some uh, opportunities at European level at the moment in the field of uh, of care. Um, so the you know the research we are discussing and all the findings we are discussing, all these can in a way be evidence to support also uh, these policies or to underpin these uh, these policies. I just wonder, uh, you know, if you what you know what are the opportunities you see you see at European level with your members? What are the priorities of your members in the field of uh, in the field of care? If you can tell us something about uh, about that, Valentina. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, well, needless to say that at the moment, one of the biggest priority is for us uh, the recovery and resilience facility plans and the implementation of that, because a lot of money will be channeled in the health sector and uh, in the social sector, also through the use of uh, the national plans. And in um, a lot of uh, countries across Europe, this also is a, a competence then in terms of implementation for regions. So they are going to receive a lot of money also to implement projects on the ground. And uh, there are examples, for instance, I'm thinking about Italy where um, community in terms of uh, houses uh, uh, should be built across uh, the territories also to address these topics uh, through the use of, uh, of the plans, for instance. Uh, and as I mentioned before, um, or probably I didn't, uh, besides what is uh, the National Recovery um, uh, Resilience and Facility Funds, the other important point is uh, also the European structural and investment funds. So the funds the European Union is given directly to regions uh, to implement uh, infrastructures, either tangible, intangible, at um, uh, territorial level. Uh, so the new programming period just started. And uh, this means that regions are really prioritizing uh, investment and strategies to invest, and especially to boost innovation. And I think that uh, this is what is really important uh, for my members. It's really also to ensure uh, that these funds are used in an innovative way to foster innovation in the health and social care systems. Uh, so this is why through these projects uh, such as SHAPES and Inforaja, we can actually you know, gather inputs uh, to understand why, where there are the innovative solutions, uh, if they are tested and then can work and how this can be embedded at systems level. And this is why we're also working a lot on another topic, uh, which is procurement for innovative solutions. And this is something very relevant if you really would like to foster change uh, in, the, in the health systems. Uh, if you want to acquire something that is not really on the market yet, but you know, can be customized also for the needs of the citizen of your territory. So this is another topic that I think is part of the discussion that we are having today, more at system level. And, uh, and needless to say, so beside infrastructure, uh, the other topic that we mentioned already, it's the collaboration among stakeholders, so the ecosystems, and how to, uh, let's say, reinforce this, the ecosystem across Europe. We have reference sites uh, um, across Europe, uh, the uh, AIP on AHA I mentioned before, the, uh, the work that we are doing with InforAHA again, I think it's uh, relevant to uh, build upon that community. Uh, and this is what uh, we need. Uh, we need to scale up uh, innovative solution uh, across Europe on the long run. Uh, and we, we really count on you also for, uh, for this activity. Thank you, Valentina. Very, very useful. Uh, you show how you know our projects need to be based and respond and, and engage with uh, users, with people, with older people and uh, people with disabilities. We saw that in this in dialogue workshop. That was our main goal to put those realities uh, on the table and to and to really put them at the center of the work we are doing in shapes. And really, is, there is true efforts uh, made in, in this direction. And we have also to engage with uh, other stakeholders, as you as you were saying, and be part of those debates and uh, engage with policymakers. That's engaging with policymakers is one of the key ways in which we can ensure that what we are doing in the project can have some uh, translation into real life. And that's also an ambition of uh, of, of shapes. Um, a lot, and I, I was wondering, um, also in this perspective, your research, you will be producing actually a guidance uh, to support uh, older people, also professionals, also informal carers, in uh, in making decisions in the context of transiting between different care care settings. Um, I just uh, wonder, uh, you know, if you have any plans on how you can how this can be best uh, done in terms of engaging with 
the potential uh, users of this guidance with other people with services as well, even with policymakers as well. Do you have any plans in this perspective uh, or any ambitions that you would like to share with, uh, with us now? No? Uh, yes and no. Yes, because I think it's <laughs> very important and needed. And uh, from the early beginning of this study, uh, I'm trying to present and to consult with different stakeholders here in Belgium that are relevant to the Flemish uh, context and to send them in advance uh, research protocols, research plans in order to show them what our plan to give to, to get sorry feedback and then to make sure that they are engaged uh, with the process. And after that, once we have the results and the findings and the guidance tool, they would like to uh, implement that. Why not? Because I don't know yet what will be the guidance tool because that's related uh, from the results of uh, the focus groups and the nominal group techniques. So it depends how the guidance tool will look like and who will be specifically the target populations. And then we can move on uh, also with the uh, implementation strategies uh, of this uh, project. Um, but it's a very, very valid and uh, important uh, question. I must say that the institutions that we work with in order to collect the data are the most uh, involved and updated all the time uh, because we would like to conduct a pilot. And in this pilot, we will get a lot of feedbacks and insights, and then we will try uh, to improve uh, the guidance tool. And I think it will help with the dissemination and implementation. Okay, thank you, thank you, Lotan. Thanks, and good luck with with that and those plans. Um, and of course, yeah. with each platform, uh, of course. Of course, <laughs> uh, with, of course, with our support. Of course, yeah. As as Valentina mentioned, we have to work together to make sure that the good research and good evidence and good solutions are really can be scaled up. So, so of course, we can we can work in the future again. Uh, I was wondering if there are other uh, questions. Um, and before we we end this panel we have only three minutes left um there was a, a comment uh, from uh, malati in the chat that i think is important and it's addressed uh, mostly to lotan um she says in the previous session we discussed about stigma discrimination and social isolation does lotan's research also uh, is also like able to find the correlation uh, of this with empowerment in decision making. So that social stigma and ageism and ableism actually, do you find any evidence that this has an impact on, on, on decision making on, on, on empowering people to make decisions about their own care? To be honest, it was not the focus, but I think that this comment is very important and is related to your question, Boja. I think that one of the targets of the implementation of this guidance tool will be to make sure that we address and take under consideration the factors of ageism, the factors of uh, inequalities and in different uh, perspectives according to cultures. Because when we give um, a guidance or recommendations of a study uh, such as, we would like really to make sure that all the populations uh, would be able to, to use this, uh, this guidance. So we, we did not focus specifically on stigma uh, or ageism uh, or inequalities, uh, but I'm coming from the world of uh, social epidemiology and I think that we will really stress it uh, in the appendixes of the guidance tool. Once you want to implement, please pay attention to one, two, three, four. So thanks for that. So taking taking diversity into account in developing your research, which is with what we are trying to do in yeah. we are trying to do in shapes, and also we are trying to explore in this uh, in this uh, data workshop. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there are other uh, questions, uh, additional questions from any other participants. If not, uh, we are getting close to uh, the time for the next uh, part of this uh, Dara workshop. So I will thank to both uh, Valentina and Lotan for your participation and for all your insights. Very, very useful, really. And uh, for me, the, the main message is that we have to continue in touch because we are really you know, working on very similar fields and we can really do much better work if we work together. So thanks. Uh, thanks for that to both of you, Valentina and Lotan. Thanks. Thank Thanks. I give the floor now to Elenia to present the last, uh, our last uh, speaker and last part. Yes, sorry. 
Uh, thank you, Barha. Our next speaker is indeed uh, our Secretary General, Maciek Kuharczyk. Um, I would like indeed to give him the floor to convey some wrap up and conclusion messages for this session. Maciek, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ilenia. Can you hear me? Yes, and can you see me as well? I'm trying in principle, to add yes. you in as a pin. You have a black uh, over your yeah. video. Now? Perfect. Yes, now finally. Perfect. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, again, good afternoon, dear partners, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is my privilege, but obviously a pleasure to close this uh, debate uh, workshop. Uh, thank you, first of all, to all of you for your presence, for the very rich and uh, constructive uh, discussion. Uh, thank you all for the active involvement in, in this webinar. Uh, I think that with this dialogue that we have had uh, this morning, the SHAPES uh, project uh, aimed to expose what we call the lived realities of uh, older people, uh, older people with disabilities, with our aim of challenging uh, prejudices around aging. Uh, through the overview of uh, SHAPE stories, we also, I hope, uh, we have highlighted uh, the other objective of our project, which is basically uh, to address the needs of uh, the users of technological solution. We also, uh, it was very interesting, I followed almost everything of, uh, of the discussion this morning, we gained new insights which I hope will help your actual workers, researchers to adapt your developments to the needs and concerns of, uh, of this very heterogeneous population group of, uh, of other people. To use uh, the motto of, of the movement of persons with disabilities, I would here just uh, say nothing about us without us. Let me maybe now uh, to formulate at least to attempt to formulate some first take-home messages uh, from, uh, from the uh, different uh, sessions this morning. From, from, from the first session, the introduction, very rich, already very illustrative. Uh, I think it is never enough to remind that older people uh, have indeed equal rights uh, in our societies. Joke uh, did it so eloquently, reminding us that older people actually, they have a full life, they have plans, they have dreams, and this does not change with age or disability. We also heard how people with uh, older people with disabilities experience additional barriers, actually as they uh, uh, age. Uh, it was, I think, Sanya and Mark, you highlighted the many challenges um, faced when aging persons, uh, aging with a combination of sight and, and hearing loss. Uh, you also urged to end so, um, isolation of older people uh, and insisted on this need to always consult people concerned by research. So we take up this uh, message from this session, let us bring technology as close as possible to people's realities. Also, you, Mark, you explained in your introduction that, shame, that the SHAPES project aims to support people to stay in their communities. This is a demand uh, older people express, staying at home and remaining able to participate and contribute to society. So indeed, this project seeks to put technology at the service of this broader uh, societal goal. In the session two, it was very, uh, inch, well, not interesting. It was just uh, so perfectly illustrating when we heard from Shape's uh, ethnographic study um, about all those different obstacles older people face to live as equals, including, for example, a very strong stigma. But also these stories showed us uh, that older people, they have this willingness to live just like uh, anyone else. Uh, for Utah, older age is a period full of opportunities and freedom. We heard about Donna uh, and her vivid memories kept fresh thanks to technology about uh, Al uh, Algeria and how technology helps her to live better with her uh, again um, death and blindness uh, impairments and finally we heard how good technologies need to be coupled with an accessible physical environment to enable participation and inclusion 
Then moving to to the third session, uh, I think if if we we are looking for a, a major uh, take home from from what was shared, it's that actually there is still a lot which uh, remains to be done at all different levels to build a Europe, a society that will be accessible for everyone, regardless of age or disability. And in this last panel, you gave, um, uh, well, actually, it was the opportunity to give the voice to all other partners and researchers outside of the shapes who are committed to improve the living conditions of older people. So thank you very much for your additional insights. Part of this project is to open uh, our discussion, go to beyond just the partners. It's a learning process, it's an exchange, and this is what we will be doing over the <clears throat> remaining months and years, actually, of this project. So to sum up, I would say understanding people's diverse realities, this is a sine qua non condition to respond to the needs through technologies. And yet we know that this is not a simple task. Actually, if I may, I would like to come back to this question of ageism and discrimination. Each of us carries, carries a set of prejudices, stereotypes, and sometimes even uh, attitudes with, which are discriminatory. Actually, we have to, uh, I think uh, it's a mm, learning by doing. We can be all ages, but we have to be conscious about it and then make uh, a tangible uh, change. Prejudices and attitudes uh, are particularly pre uh, prevalent actually against older people. This is a taboo. This is not something which is recognized in the policymaking, uh, in many, but also in the research. Uh, so this is an objective for us. Approaches that consider older people as uh, passive, for example, receivers of care, are also frequent. Unfortunately, this focus on dependency, on the lack of autonomy, on vulnerability, uh, these focuses are very widespread in society, in policies, in research. So in our discussion on how technology can support older people with disabilities in their daily lives, we must address these prejudices against stereotypes and the act of discrimination. And, and I think that we've managed to make a first step this morning. This is what we've made. Uh, we wanted to ensure that in what we do and in what we say, actually, uh, we consider, we help that everyone will be living as equals. Uh, now, very briefly, as you know, Age Platform Europe, we are a self-advocacy uh, European network. We voice uh, the um, realities, daily realities uh, of older people, and we aim, obviously, to... Uh, uh, transpose these realities into um, policymaking, both at the European and the national level, in order to ensure uh, that um, the policymaking will uh, contribute tangibly to build what we call, it's our vision of Age Platform Europe, a society for, for all ages. Uh, as an example, last year, the Council of the European Union, and it was for the first time in 10 years that there was a specific focus by our governments in the European uh, Council conclusions on older people. Actually, they uh, so these Council conclusions uh, under the German presidency, then they focused on the human rights, participation and well-being of older people in the era of digitalization. These conclusions call, uh, called to guarantee uh, the accessibility of public services, in particular health, social and long-term care ser services, while making sure that non-digital services are maintained. I think it's a, a fantastic way, uh, well, it's a, first of all, a very encouraging sign by our, our governments that they do understand actually the challenges that older people face in the society, certainly in this uh, extremely fast developing society of new technologies, and that there is a space for uh, improvement. Technologies, they bring solutions, but they will not bring them as long uh, uh, unless we actually take into consideration all the different barriers that must be addressed in, uh, in the deployment of, uh, of technology. Um, so now uh, I think that the shapes uh, as a European uh, uh, Union funded project, as such, we are actually working to make sure that uh, we will close 
uh, all those various uh, gaps that still exist between the realities of older people, older people uh, with uh, disabilities on one hand side and the technolo technology that we actually design for older people. So to all partners of, of the SHAPES project, I would like to say today, let's take up fully this challenge uh, all together. I will stop here. Uh, I know that uh, we are almost at the end uh, of, um, of our time before maybe really the um, final uh, remarks uh, uh, to let's say carry on from this webinar to, to the next one. I don't know whether you, Elenia, you would like to step back uh, uh, and say something or should I go directly and close uh, our debate? You, you can go on and closing for me. It's fine, my check. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, as you know, yes, we are far from the end of, of the project. It's just one of the uh, of different steps uh, that are foreseen uh, during the SHAPES uh, implementation. Uh, and therefore today's uh, event, today's webinar uh, will actually hand, uh, actually we are doing right now. So we are handing over the button to the SHAPES partner um, uh, in Italy. Uh, you will organize the next dialogue workshop that will take place in April uh, next year. Uh, I don't know whether it will take place physically or in uh, virtual format. This is something that you know uh, Better uh, with the support of H Platform Europe, this upcoming event will pursue the exchange with uh, also older people, with people with disabilities, with the uh, academics, researchers, and obviously the general public. So um, we will present uh, um, the most recent research from the project and connect the dots with the uh, life uh, words of individuals. So again. Uh, a big thank you uh, to all of you, to my colleagues, Ilenia Borja, uh, for coordinating this, but also other colleagues that I do not maybe know uh, personally, but I know that you are all together actually making a team to uh, through this project. So thank you very much for all those uh, efforts done in between different uh, partners. Thank you very much to you, all participants, speakers, for your precious time, for your contributions. And uh, we look forward uh, to uh, meeting you very soon at the next uh, dialogue workshop. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon.